So let's begin with Tetzaveh. All right, so here we are. I got the high priest here. And Tetzaveh means what? Command. Now right there in the middle is the word Tzav. And Tzav, there's another Torah portion called Tzav, which means command. <laughs> and so in Hebrew, they take the word and they put different things, letters around it. And here you have, you shall command. So what's the commandment? Look at Exodus 27, verse 20 and 21. You shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil, olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn when? All right, so here we got the, the menorah, we got the lamp, and it's to be burning how long? Always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil. So what's behind the veil is the Ark of the Covenant. On the other side of the veil is this menorah, uh, and it says without the veil, which is before the testimony, that's the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets in it, and then it says, Aaron and his son shall order it from when? Why? Because evening and morning is one day. It starts in the evening. So evening to morning before the Lord, and it's to be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. So the, uh, the priests were to light it on behalf of the children of Israel. And they had to do it every day of the week, Okay every day of the week. In other words, the light always was to shine. Are you a light? You were always to shine every day of the week. We don't turn our light on Sunday and then turn it off the rest of the week. We don't turn our light on Shabbat and then turn it off the rest of the week. It's like every morning we got to light the coals on the fire. Sometimes, how you know, we feel cold. We just don't feel close. Well, maybe because the fire's not lit. And so it's up to us to light the fire. If a lot of the Christians say, well, we're priests and kings. Well, you're lighting your fire every morning. Uh, you know, that's part of the job of the priest. Look at Exodus 28, 1 and 2. And I, I want to see if you catch something. Bring Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him near to you from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron. Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Itamar, Aaron's son. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Did anything stand out? <clears throat> the name of Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. I mean, why did he have to keep saying Aaron? We all knew he was talking about Aaron from the very beginning. What's going on here? Today's Torah portion is all about Aaron. Moses' name is not mentioned once in this entire Torah portion. Get a load of this. If you look at all the Torah portions, this is just... Now, Genesis, of course, Moses isn't being mentioned. But Exodus, at his birth, he is... Uh, from Exodus through Deuteronomy, Moses is... Moses, he's in every Torah portion, but not this one. He disappears in this Torah portion. As a matter of fact... Aaron is the only one that's talked about in this particular Torah portion. Moses is never mentioned. Moses is mentioned 800 times from the time he's born to the end of the Deuteronomy. Aaron is mentioned 37 times in just this one Torah portion. And Moses, like he doesn't even exist. What is going on here? Well, it so happens in Hebrew, there are values of the numbers and here is one through 10. And then the letter cough is 20. And I'm showing you the cough at the beginning of a word and the cough at the end of the word. It changes shapes just like our capital M changes shapes to a little m. In Hebrew, this letter changes shape when it's at the end of a word. But cough is 20. Everybody see that? Okay, 20. Now... Look, uh, let me see if I have this verse. Okay, I don't have it here. What's amazing is Moses, when he is trying to make atonement for the sin of the golden calf, I think it's Exodus 32, 32. And he says, if, if, we, can't, if we can't make atonement, 
Moses says, blot me, I pray you, out of your book. Well, guess what? That is the word, me sifraka. And right there in the middle is sefer, which means book. Blot me out of your book. Okay, so here is the cough at the end makes it your, and the mem is from. So that is the word from your book. Moses is asking to be blotted out of his book. Well, guess what? Your book, your, is the letter cough, which is the 20th letter. And so God blotted him out of the 20th Torah portion. Isn't that amazing? In your book, which is the Torah, that your book is the cough, which is the 20th Torah portion, and Moses' name is blotted out of the 20th Torah portion. Only God could do something like that. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, also typically, now this year there's two Adars, and this is the first of Adar. And what's amazing, Adar 7 was just this last week, and that was the day Moses died. So the Torah portion of Moses not being mentioned is the same week every year that he also passes away. Only God can do things like this. Okay, Deuteronomy, let's jump over there for a minute. I want to talk about uh, Moses' death. Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 8, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beit Peor. No one knows of his sepulcher to this day. And Moses was how old? 120 when he died. His eye was a dim. His natural force wasn't abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for how many days? 30 days. Okay, so how do we know he died on the seventh of Adar? And nowhere does the Bible say he died on the seventh of Adar. It's called math. We know they wept for 30 days, right? What happened after the 30 days of mourning? Look at Joshua 1, 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. The Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Noon. Moses, the son of Noon, catch that, the fish. Okay, Moses as minister, and he said, Moses is dead. Joshua, time to get up. You mourn for him 30 days. Let's get moving on into the promised land. You know, he says, arise, go over this Jordan, you and everyone to the land that I'm giving you, even to the children of Israel. Okay, so now we know Moses dies. They mourn for 30 days. And then God says to Joshua, go enter the promised land, but it takes three days. How do we know it takes three days? Well, look at what Joshua chapter one, verse 11 says. They're to pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare food because in three days, we're going to pass over Jordan to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. Well, what happens? Joshua 4, 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on what day of the first month? My goodness, what is 10 minus three? And what is the 30 days from the seventh of Nisan takes you to the seventh of the door? Wow. See how easy that is? It's not rocket science. I am not a rocket scientist. I just know basic math. And you can figure it out when he died by looking at this. And... Um, let me see. So Adar 7 was also his birthday. He died on the same day he was born. Yes. Now, <clears throat> uh, yeah, here is uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 1 and 2. Moses went and spoke all these words to Israel and said to them, I'm 120 years old today. Today's my birthday. So here we see he was born on the same day he died. Now, here, Exodus 32, 32 is the other verse I told you where he says, if not forgiving their sin, blot me, I pray, from your book, which you have written. And so here's me, Sephiroka, and it's the 20th Torah portion. So I want you to see how all of this ties together. Okay, so now here we go. Back to Exodus 28, verse 9 through 12. 
he was to take two onyx stones. And I have up in this picture, these are uh, the shoulder stones, the two onyx stones. The breastplate had the names of the children of Israel according to how they traveled. On the shoulder stones were the names of the children of Israel, how they were born. Okay, so they're both shoulder stones and the breastplate. <clears throat> and it says here, I want you to engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and six on the other stone, according to what? Okay, so on the stones, it was according to their birth. On the breastplate, it was according to how they traveled. Uh, and then it says, you're to uh, make them to be in settings of gold, and you're to put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod for stones of a memorial to the sons of Israel. Now look at this. And Aaron is to bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for what? Okay, how many of you know everything in Moses' tabernacle was patterned after the one in the heavens? That means the Lord himself has two shoulder stones bearing the names of the children of Israel. And he's bearing everything, okay? So you don't want to forget that. This is, there are no Catholics or Methodists or Baptists or Pentecostals on his shoulder stones. There's the names of the children of Israel. It's all based on a pattern, and Aaron is to represent the Messiah as our high priest in his ministry. Um, and guess what? It was on his shoulders he carried the wooden beam that he would die on, bearing the sins for Israel. And then over his heart, he also carries the name of the children of Israel. But the amazing thing, why God is giving Moses all of this about how Aaron is to be honored, Aaron is worshiping a golden calf and leading everyone to worship a golden calf. He's not aware. At the very same time, God's telling Moses how to take care of Aaron. Aaron's down here on earth, which reminds me of another thing. Why do you think uh, Aaron... Worship the golden calf. Led everyone in worshiping the golden calf. I don't know if you knew this, but do you remember the very first thing that happened before this incident, Amalek attacked. <clears throat> and then who was held, holding up Moses' arms? Aaron and Ur. <clears throat> Joshua is out there fighting Amalek. Well, they say when it came to the golden calf, Ur was trying to stop everybody and they murdered him. That's why you don't hear any more from him. And Aaron was so afraid, he went ahead and did the will of the people. But moving on. Um, here, little does Aaron know how at the very moment in time that God is awarding him the role of the high priesthood, he's allowing the people to promote him into that position ahead of time and have him make the idol of the golden calf. Just like Saul. Why did Saul do what he did? He feared the people. We need to have rulers that don't fear the people, that they just do what God does. But right now, everyone, all politicians are serving the hand that feeds them, that pays them. That's what they do. There are big donors and they do their will. But the other thing is, Aaron didn't wait for God's timing. How often does the church, because they don't know the times and the seasons, they're plucking at planting time and planting at plucking time. They're gonna do the same thing. This is why we got to know God's timing. Look at Exodus 32, 21. Moses says to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you let this great sin come on them? And Aaron said, don't be angry. You've seen how the purposes of this people are only evil. Well, what do we see in the Haftorah? 1 Samuel 15, 24, Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. Now, in Hebrew, there's like 10 different levels of sin. I mean, deep, 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 deep. And here Saul says, oh, I just sinned a little bit. He didn't see it as a grievous sin as it really was. And he said, I have transgressed. Well, that's a, that's a little you know, deeper, the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Are we supposed to fear the people or fear God? Fear God. <clears throat> and then in Exodus 28, 15, 
He says you're to make a breastplate of judgment, the work of the skillful workman, like the work of the ephod. You shall make it gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine, linen. You shall make it. Now look at Exodus 28, 21. The stones shall be according to the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, uh, like the engravings of a signet, everyone according to his name, they shall be for the 12 tribes. So now they're on the breastplate according to how they traveled. And then in Exodus 29, 19 and 20, and then he says, uh, you're to take the other ram, Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the head of the ram. You'll kill the ram and take part of its blood, put it on the tip of the right ear, on the tips of the right ears of his sons, on the thumb of their right hands, on the big toe of their right foot, and then throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Why were they to put the blood on their ear, big toe, and them? <clears throat> So they can hear the word of the Lord, they can do the work of the Lord, and they'll walk in the way of the Lord. Exactly. Then verse 38 and 39, it says, now this is that which you shall offer on the altar, two lambs of the first year, how often? Day by day. One lamb you'll offer in the morning and the other lamb in the evening. Okay. Now look at Exodus 29, 42 through 46. You're to have a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle before the Lord. Look at this. This is where I will meet you, to speak there to you. There I will meet with the children of Israel. Then it says, and the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory. I will sanctify the tabernacle, the congregation, and the altar. I will sanctify both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. I will dwell among the children of Israel and I'll be their God and they will know that I'm the Lord their God that brought them out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Where it says among them in Hebrew, it literally means within them. Within them. That's what God wants to do. He wants to dwell within us. And then look at Exodus 30 verse 7 and 8. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he's to burn incense. And when Aaron lights the lamp at even, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Do you know what this is telling us? And this is what you have to get a hold of. There's nothing wrong with the church meeting on Sunday. We're supposed to be meeting every day of the week. It doesn't make it the Sabbath, but don't get on. I mean, too many people are Torah terrorists. You know, my gosh, who cares if they meet on Sunday? Every, they had to meet every day at the temple. So there's nothing wrong with them worshiping on Sunday. It just means it's not the Sabbath. And I find most Sunday churches don't mind you saying that as long as you're not condemning them for doing Sunday. I mean, is our purpose to destroy people and say we're smarter than you? Duh. Or is it to build bridges? We have to build bridges, guys. Okay. How many of us know that the incense is likened to our prayers, right? Guess what that means? We should be praying every morning and every evening. If we call ourselves a priest as part of the church, or priest. Well, then do the work of a priest, okay? Every single morning, our prayer life shouldn't be just some random scattering of half-breathed prayers. Uh, we should try to establish a daily time of prayer. Even if it's five minutes, you'll find out it can grow. It'll grow. It will grow, even if it's one minute. I don't care, but start. Because then it becomes a daily habit. And the thing about it, it helps you recognize God's presence and authority over our lives. The fact that there was a tree of good and evil in that garden of plenty tells them that they're not the boss. There's someone that says no. And that's the thing. Every morning when I get up, I say the modei ani. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up and restoring my soul within me. You know, and that's the first thing I do every morning. And, and it's like, okay, I know you're there. I know you're watching. <laughs> but it's good for us <clears throat> because all of us think it's about us. You ain't the boss of me. I mean, that's the way people live. Someone is the boss of you. 
Now, Leviticus 23, 2, I want to jump in here. It says, speak to the children of Israel and tell them concerning the feast of the Lord. That should be retranslated. It should be concerning the meeting times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my meeting times. And, uh, you know, if you've got a, a date you don't want to miss, you're not going to miss it. You know, I can find that some people just can't get up in the morning. But if they have an exciting thing they're going to do at six in the morning, they're going to go fishing or they're going to go hunting or whatever it is. All of a sudden, man, they're up an hour early. They're ready to go. Funny how that is. Leviticus 23, 4. Again, these are the meeting times of the Lord, even holy convocations which he shall proclaim at their times. That's the whole job here at El Shaddai Ministries. It's all about the calendar. It's all about the meeting times. We want everyone to come to the meeting. So now we're seeing a connection between meeting, time, festivals. God says, I'm going to meet you at the meeting. I'm going to speak to you there at the meeting, in the meeting place. It's not just a time, it's a place. Everyone also had to have a part in bringing the light. Uh, the tabernacle system denotes the time, the place, where God is, and where his people are to meet. Now, let me ask you something. Think about this for a minute. Could God meet with them anywhere because he's everywhere? No. Okay. Let me ask you this. Was God, during the Exodus, when the Shekinah is on the tabernacle, was he also in China? Yeah. He's everywhere. But he doesn't meet with them over there. He meets with them here. Yes, God is everywhere. That's why people, well, every day is a Sabbath for me. Well, that's fine. It's your Sabbath, though. It's not his. Okay, so we have to realize that this is so important. This is where God speaks to Moses. It's where his sacrifice are brought daily to God. All right, these sacrifice were always brought at specific times. And the festivals were at specific dates and times. So here's what's important. Meeting God, it seems, is intimately involved with time. This is why God had to get him out of Egypt, okay? It's not a chance meeting. Like with Amalek, with Balaam, these are chance meetings. But we're talking about a meeting that is determined by God, and it has to be according to his time at the place of his choosing. In fact, the very word meeting itself is a word that tends to denote time, place, and connectedness between two people. Can you get married if the bride and the groom can't agree on where or when to meet, to do it? It doesn't work, does it? Okay. In this case, meeting God refers to time at his choosing and the place and where. So, uh, again, this is all about the biblical calendar. This is why we have to get on the biblical calendar. And then we see, I don't know what time it is. Okay. Exodus 30, verse 10. Aaron is to make atonement on the horns of the altar once a year uh, with the blood of the sin offering. He's to make atonement once uh, in the year throughout your generations. And then in Exodus 30, uh, verse 11 through 16, uh, we see they were to do a census and they were to use a half of a shekel. Uh, and then in bold at the bottom, it says, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tabernacle. It's kind of like a tax. Okay, you gotta, you've got to maintain this tabernacle. So the poor uh, couldn't pay less and the rich couldn't pay more. It was the same for everyone. Everyone had to pay a half a shekel. Do you know when, they, when this tax came? It was always on the first of Adar because it is a month before Nisan when Passover is going to come. And when you know that this always happens on the first of Adar, when you read Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27, they had come to Capernaum and they that received the half shekel came to Peter and says, doesn't your teacher pay the half a shekel? That whole story, now you know this happened in the month of Adar. 
because that is the month that they took the collection. Uh, but that's what makes it fun reading the Gospels. When you understand the calendar and what the season is, everything starts making sense. Here's Capernaum. I've been there many times, right there on the Sea of Galilee. And that's where Peter lived. This here, this synagogue, uh, you can't really, this is in the, uh, on the other side. This synagogue here was built during the time of Constantine in the 300s. But underneath it is black basalt that was the original synagogue that Yeshua went in with Peter. You can see both layers when you go there. And <clears throat> this area is not from 2,000 years ago, but this is over Peter's house. Peter's house was there, and biblically you can prove it, it talks about he left the synagogue and walked into his house and went to the water. I mean, it's just all right there. Okay, now let's go to Matthew 5, 13. It says, you are the what? But if it taste goes from the salt, how are you going to make it salty again? It is then good for nothing but to be put out and crushed under foot by men. Okay. I'm going to explain this verse to you. Get a load of this. Our English word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, and the Latin root word of salarium is sol. From the Latin root word sol, we get our English word salt. That is why when they say a person is not worth their salt, it means they're not giving the value for the money they were paid. So when you look how God redeemed you and you don't put forth any effort or work, in one sense, God is paying you. I mean, he's give, he says he gives one, one talent, one five talent, one 10 talents. He gives us all of this and he tells us to get to work and we're gonna come before him and he's gonna say, you weren't worth your salt. I paid you. I gave you all of this, but one, well, I took mine and dug it in the dirt. Are you following? That's what, when it says, if your salt, if, if the taste goes away, if, if you're not producing anything for the kingdom, if you're just producing things for yourself, all you're going to have is the works you did for you. When you go before him, you're not going to have any of the works you did for him. Interesting way of looking at that verse. You didn't give the value for the money that you were paid. Now let's look at Matthew 5, the next verses, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town put on a hill may be seen by all. A burning light isn't put under a vessel, but on a table, so that its rays may be shining on all who are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men. Why? So they may see your what? good works. But now here's the other problem. So people say, well, Jews think they're saved by works. They've never thought they were saved by works. They know the light of the Torah, they're supposed to do works because they're God's children. And look, it doesn't say that they can see your good works and glorify you. It says they can see your good works and glorify him. Why? Because you're working for him. But if you're not worth your salt, that means you're doing everything for your glory, not his. Is this getting a little deep? <laughs> I hope you guys are getting this. Okay, I got one more minute. Look at Proverbs. Oh, here we go. Here's the salt I have here on the salt. Money, time, value. How do you spend your time? That's what's important. It's how do you spend your time? What do you value? How, if all of your money is spent on you and none of it is spent on building the kingdom, you're telling God it's all about you. His kingdom isn't worth nearly as important as your kingdom. I have no time for you, God. I'm too busy. Oh my gosh, we need to realize we got to get our priorities straight. We value what we spend our time on. That's what we, we value, where we spend our time. That's what we value. 
If you value the TV, you'll spend your life in front of the TV. Okay, but look at this, Proverbs 6, 20 through 23. My son, keep your father's commandment. Don't forsake the law of your mother. Bind them upon your heart. Tie them about your neck. And when you go, it will lead you. And when you sleep, it'll keep you. And when you awake, it will talk with you because the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. The five foolish virgins have no light. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Don't think I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And people don't understand that. So many Christians think, well, Jesus fulfilled that. I don't have to. Well, wait a minute. It says love is the fulfilling of the law. Well, I don't need to love anybody now. Jesus did that for me. Can you see how dumb that is? The word fulfilled doesn't mean I did it so you don't have to. It means I'm showing you how to do it. That's why when he fulfills it, it means he's showing you how to love. Because a stalker may love somebody, but the person they're stalking doesn't see that as love at all. So what the Torah does, it defines love. And that's why Matthew 5, 19, whoever therefore will break even one of these smallest commandments and then teaches others to do so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, whatever Whoever will do them and teach them, the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So our job is to teach that they're great and do them. You don't get paid for not doing something. If you get hired by McDonald's and you sit in your car all day, you're not going to get paid. We get paid for what we do and we get paid in salt. Our salary is based on how much value and time and money we spend in building his kingdom. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand. Oh, the second half is going to be so fun, I can hardly wait. Okay. Oh, and uh, for all of you, after we're done uh, saying the blessing, there's food and snacks downstairs. Uh, you can go however you want to get downstairs uh, by the elevator. Avino Mokenu. Our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much. Father, you want all of us, even as it says in the book of James, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And we know we're not saved by works, but we know you saved us to put us to work. And the job is to glorify you by our works because we're to bear good fruit. And so, Father, I just pray for everyone here that they would all have eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand. And I just thank you so much for all of those here locally and all those around the United States and all over the world that want to be a light of the world, that want to build your kingdom, not their own. And so we just thank you for any tithes and offerings that come in to help build your kingdom, to make the Torah honorable once again, and that it may be magnified. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. I'm going to need you guys to fasten your seatbelts because I know I don't talk very fast and I'm going to have to pick it up. I like talking uh, right now. We're digging deeper into the gospels and uh, we want to do a, a nose dive and go really deep today. So uh, basically from the gospels, we're going to be mostly in the gospel of John. I want to bring a highlight some of the history. Okay, so, uh, okay, everybody look up here. I don't want you cheating. I don't want you looking at your notes. All right. Does anyone know the name of King David's mother? King David's mother. What was King David's mother's name? You are about to find out. Her name was Nitzavet. N-I-T-Z-E-V-E-T, -E -E Nitzavet. Now, all of us know King David was a type of Messiah, right? Yes. Obviously had his faults. Okay, he's a type of Messiah. But let's take a look at some of these events here. 
<clears throat> in Acts chapter 3, verse 24 through 26, it says, yes, and all the prophets from who? Samuel. Samuel lived during the time of King David. He's the one who anointed him. And those who follow, so we also see Samuel was a prophet. As many have spoken, have also foretold of these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Yeshua, sent him to bless you. And how does he bless us? He turns every one of us away from hell. No, he turns us away from our sins. Now, so let's jump back to Samuel. He was a prophet. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Beit Lechem, Judah, named Jesse, who had how many sons? And he was an old man, Samuel was in Saul's day, and far on in years. Now, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone with Saul to the fight. This is against the Philistines. The story of Goliath is in here. Okay, so Jesse has eight sons. And the three oldest are in the military. Now, look at Numbers 1, verse 3. All those of 20 years old and over who are able to go to war in Israel are to be numbered by you and Aaron. So how old were they before they could enter the military? 20. So if he has eight sons, three of them in the military, that tells you five of them aren't 20 years old yet. I'm going to tell you how to figure out how old David was when he fought Goliath. Okay, we already know that the other sons have to be younger than 20 because they didn't go to the fight. All right, now, let's go to Acts 4.11. Here it's talking about the stone that was rejected by you builders has become the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, it doesn't tell you the name, but what is that name? Yeshua. Right. Now, but as David was a type of the Messiah, David is writing this. This comes from the Psalms 118. And we're going to look at that. Because we're seeing here, there's no other name under heaven given among men which must be saved. It's not exactly Yeshua, but it is Yeshua. But we got to go to this psalm to see what name they're talking about. Okay, let's go. Psalm 118, verse 20 through 22. This is quoting that verse. So let's see what name it is. This gate of the yud Hey vav Hey. It's all in caps. That means it's the yud Hey vav Hey into which right, the righteous will enter, I will praise you, for you, the Yudhei Bafe, have answered me, and you have become my what? Amen. So there's no other name under heaven by which man may be saved, but by the Yudhei Bafe. Now, Yeshua is the Yudhei Bafe. I mean, you can be dad, you can be pops, you can be grandpa. Okay, God has lots of names, okay? But basically, it's the yud heh vav -Hey, and we know Yeshua is the yud heh vav -Hey. But this is where this comes from. And then it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So salvation is only through the Lord, the yud heh vav -Hey. Okay, <clears throat> so I have up here, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. But I want to show you something from the Hebrew that you don't always see. This could also be translated as the stone which the sons have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. All right. Well, it's like all the other sons of Israel rejected him as their Messiah. The Hebrew word for builders is bonim. And we know Ben is son, and Bonim is sons, okay? So this could also be translated that way. Well, let's go to the Gospel of John now, chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. We see his brothers said to him, 
Well, go on up to Judea that your disciples may see the works that you do, for there's no one that does anything in secret and doesn't want to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Okay? So even his brothers reject, everyone is rejecting him. Now, Yeshua, who is the son of David, he mirrors, David's life mirrors Yeshua's life. And I'm going to show you how. It's from Psalms 69. Psalm 69, David is heartbroken and he's writing about his being heartbroken. This is David's cry out to God because of all the grief he suffered in his life. Okay? I don't know how many of you ever studied David's childhood. But David's childhood was absolutely the worst life you could ever have. Most people only know him as King On. But I'm going to tell you about his childhood. Let's start. Let's look at Psalm 69, 1 and 2. It says, To the chief musician upon Shoshanim, uh, which means trumpets, it's a psalm of who? David. And look at his first phrase. Save me, O God. The waters are coming to my soul. I'm sinking deep in mire where there's no even standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. So here he's, he's sinking. He's in trouble. And he's saying, save me, O God. <clears throat> now, look at this. Second Samuel 19, verse 7. He's a lot older. But everyone knew what a troubled life David had as a kid. And look what this guy is saying. Now, therefore, arise and go forth and speak comfortably unto your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you don't, there will not carry one with you this night. And that will be worse unto you than all the evil that befell you from your youth until now. People aren't connecting dots. He had the most horrendous life in the world And you're going to see why. But I want to give you the scripture verses that back up what I'm about to tell you. As a matter of fact, look at John 15, 25 through 26. It came to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without any good reason. But when the comfort has come, whom I'm going to send you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he's going to testify of me. Well, guess where that verse comes from in the Old Testament? Psalm 69. It's David's cry. He says, look at David. Get it. I want you to, your heart to get a hold of David's heart here. I'm weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I'm waiting for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. David was suffering literally. Yes, this was prophetic, but it was also pathetic that he is being treated this way. He says, those that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Everybody hated David. Did you know everybody hated David? Look at this. Those that would destroy me being my enemies, what? Wrongfully. He had no reason to have these enemies, but those that were my enemies wrongfully are mighty. And then I want you to think about this real slow. Then I restored that which I took not away. In other words, he's being accused of stealing something he didn't steal. And he goes ahead and gives them that even though he never did it. Imagine that. If something was ever lost or stolen, David was the one accused as the natural culprit. And he was ordered in the words of the psalm to repay what I haven't even stolen. He would give things to people that he never even took anything from just to make the peace. All of his enemies are accusing him of being a thief. What's going on? Look at Psalm 69, verse 8. I become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Why would he be a stranger to his brothers, an alien to his mother's children? The word for stranger here is mutsar. Well, guess what? That word, the root word, is related to mom's there, which means a bastard. 
He was the youngest and all of his brothers and even his dad thought he was in a little illegitimate child from an affair that his mother had. That's why David thought it was he was the thief. He was the bastard child. Everyone, all of his brothers thought he wasn't a natural brother. Now, so everyone back then, oh my goodness, David is a bastard. That's how he was treated his whole life, okay? Uh, or an illegitimate offspring. Now, remember, David was already a Moabite through his great-grandma Ruth. But now he also feels like he was a, of a illegitimate birth. He's being accused of his mom having an affair with someone else. Uh, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 2 and 3, a bastard, and the Hebrew word there is mamzer, which is real close to mutzar, okay? Is not to enter the congregation of the Lord, even to how many generations? He will not enter the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter of the Lord until their 10th generation. Ruth was a Moabite. And Ruth begat Obed, Jesse, David. He's the third generation. Who is David to even go into the house of the Lord? He's of the third generation of a Moabite. So, I mean, his, even Jesse felt like he was illegitimate because Ruth was his grandma. And it's to the 10th generation. He's the second generation. And so uh, there was this big problem back then. But uh, wait till you hear the rest of the story. I don't know if you knew this, but Boaz and Ruth had David. Historically, they say Boaz died the very next day. That night, Ruth conceives Obed. Boaz dies, and all of the Israelites were saying, see, you never should have married that Moabite woman. And so that's reinforcing the fact that Jesse marrying this, uh, or uh, Boaz marrying this Moabite, and then he dies the day after the wedding day? This is what uh, is in the Jewish encyclopedia, whatever you want to call it. Okay, now go back to Psalm 69, verse 11 and 12. I made sackcloth also my garment. I became a proverb to them. Those that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. Okay, what about the Torah sages who sat in judgment? They always sat at the gates. And he says, those leaders of Israel were sitting at the gates, and they were speaking against me. They all knew, supposedly, that I was from an affair. Okay, and then it says, even the drunkards on the street corners taunt me. Even the drunkards are calling him a bastard. All right? So, I mean, what in the world did King David do to arouse such ire and contempt? See, I, I, <clears throat> the story I'm going to tell you, I want you to see there's a biblical basis for all this. He's being taunted by drunkards. Okay? The people in authority despise them. This is why... Psalm 51, 5, he writes, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't say I was born in sin. That's a total misinterpretation by Christianity. What he's saying is my mother sinned when she conceived me because I was illegitimate. Are you get connecting the dots here? From the time of his birth onwards, David was treated by his brothers as an abominable outcast. Noting the conduct of his brothers, the rest of the community assumed he was definitely a treacherous sinner full of unspeakable guilt. And when David would return from the pastures to his home in Bethlehem, he was even shunned by all the townspeople. This is his evil youth growing up. Matthew 1, 18 and 19, the birth of Yeshua, the Messiah, was like this. For after his mother Miriam was engaged, before they even came together, she was found pregnant. Okay, so let's take a look at this little chart here. All right, here, Miriam conceives around Hanukkah. 
in late December. Then it says she goes for three months at Elizabeth's house. No one sees her. Well, that's her first trimester. Okay, she may not be showing just yet, but getting close. But then what happens? You have Passover to Shavuot, her second trimester. And see, they hadn't come together yet, and everyone can see she's pregnant, and so they're wondering about Yeshua. So even in this situation, here she's showing before they even came together, because it had already been three months, and everyone likes to look when she's showing, let's calculate here. Okay, so they all knew, and so Yeshua was also considered illegitimate. As a matter of fact, look at John 8, 39 and 41. Look how the leaders treated Yeshua. Our father is Abraham. And you said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. <clears throat> you do the works of your father. And they said to him, we're not born of sexual immorality. Referring to him. We have one father, even God. Well, let's go to John 2, 16 and 17. He's uh, turning over all the tables. And he said to those that sold doves, take these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Well, where is that found? Psalm 69 from David. He goes, the zeal of your house has eaten me up, but the reproaches of those that reproached you are fallen on me. It's a correlation. In other words, <clears throat> at this time, there was no one in David's life who would provide him love, comfort, and friendship. Is there no one? Well, let's go back to Psalm 69. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was no one. And for comforters, I found none. So you're seeing how miserable David's life was growing up. <clears throat> this psalm describes the life of David as poor, despised, a lowly individual who lacks even a single friend to comfort him. Through no apparent cause of his own, he is surrounded by enemies who want to cut him down, even his own brothers or strangers uh, reviling him. Amazingly, this psalm is the voice of mighty King David, the righteous and beloved servant of God, feared and awed by all. This psalm refers to a period of about 28 years, from his earliest childhood until he was coordinated as king by the prophet Samuel. We are first introduced to David when the prophet Samuel is commanded to go to Bethlehem to anoint a new king to replace the rejected King Saul. Okay, <clears throat> how many kids did Jesse have, or boys? Eight. He had two daughters as well, but eight. But look at 1 Samuel 16.10. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Okay. And then look at 1 Samuel 16, 11 and 12. Samuel says to Jesse, are the young men finished? You know, I said, are the young men finished? Is that it? Are the young men finished? He phrased it that way because if he just said, do you have any more sons? Jesse could have said No. So Samuel purposely didn't say, do you have any more sons? He said, are the young men finished? And then uh, he goes, well, there's the youngest and he delights himself among the flock. And so Samuel said to Jesse, well, go get him. Well, we're not gonna turn around until he comes here. So he stands and brought him in and he is ready with beauty uh, of eyes, good appearance. And the Lord says to Samuel, rise up and anoint him. This is the one. So when he says, are the young men finished, Samuel really is asking prophetically. He chose those words carefully. Okay, if he would have said, are these all your sons? He would have answered, uh, yes, there were no more of his sons since David was not given the status of a son. Instead, <clears throat> Jesse answered, well, there's still left the youngest or more accurately, well, there's a small one left. He's taking care of the sheep, the small one. Uh, left behind, David was not even considered one of his sons, and David's status was small in his father's eyes. Uh, he was hoping that Samuel would proceed and allow David to remain where he was, outside of trouble, tending to the sheep in the faraway pastures, but Samuel ordered that he come. 
Okay, we'll look at Psalm 69, verse 21. At the dinner table, they gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. As David describes quite literally, I was a stranger to my brothers, a foreigner to my mother's sons. Here, they put gall in my food. They gave me vinegar to drink. They even made him sit at a separate table. They couldn't, he couldn't even eat with the rest of the family. He was treated as a bastard child. Now, look at this. How would you like to encounter a lion or a bear? Especially if you're a kid. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 36. David said to Saul, hey, I kept my father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and, I took a, and they took a lamb out of the flock. So I went out after him and I smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them since he's defied the armies of the living God. Do you understand what you're reading? David was not permitted to eat with the rest of his family. He was assigned to a separate table in the corner. He was given the task of a shepherd because they hoped that a wild beast would come and kill him when he was sent to pasture in dangerous areas full of lions and bears. Why would a dad send a child out by themselves to take care of lion food, the sheep, when he's a kid? They knew he would encounter lions and bears and he's the youngest and they make him go take care of the lion food, the sheep. He is the small one. It was King David's mother, Nitzavet, who stood by the sidelines in solidarity with her son. She was shunned as well and she also cried rivers of tears, tears awaiting the time when justice would be served. To understand the hatred that was directed toward David, we need to invest, investigate the inner workings behind all these events, the secret episodes that aren't even recorded in the book of the prophets, but are alluded to in ancient Jewish literature. Before I showed you this, I had to show you all the background of the scripture so you would understand. Okay. As we know, David's father, Jesse, was the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. After several years of being married to his wife, Nitzavet, and after having raised uh, several virtuous children, he began to entertain personal doubts about whether he's Jewish or not. Even today, everyone's trying to decide, am I Jewish? Well, back then, he was trying to figure out if he was Jewish or not because grandma was a Moabite and they can't enter until the 10th you know, generation. And so during Ruth's lifetime, many individuals were doubtful about the legitimacy of her marriage to Boaz because the Torah specifically forbids an Israelite to marry a Moabite. Since this is a nation that cruelly refused the Jewish people passage through their land and they refused food and drink to purchase when they wandered in the desert after being freed from Egypt. Back then, it was thought that this law was forbidding even the conversion of male Moabites because they were cruel and they exempted the female Moabite converts, which is why they say she converted. But God commanded Samuel, arise and anoint David without delay. He's the one I've chosen. As Samuel anointed David, the sound of weeping could be heard from Nitzavet, his mom, David's only supporter and solitary source of comfort. Her 28 long years of silence in the face of humiliation were finally coming to a close. At last, all would see that the lineage of her youngest son was pure, undefiled, and finally the anguish and humiliation that she and her son had borne would finally come to an end. So here is what happened. Okay. Going to Psalms 118, the stone which the builders rejected could also be translated as the sons rejected. All of his, the sons of Jesse, rejected David. And Nitzavet is the one who exclaimed, the stone that the sons have rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. And now they respond in verse 23, the sons realize what happened and they say, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Or this has come from God. It was hidden from our eyes. This is how Psalm 118 is being written. Okay. 
Well, I'm going to explain all of this, but I think what's fascinating is how much has been hidden from both Jewish and Christian eyes imagining a Greek Jesus over the last 2,000 years. Look how much has been hidden. When David was born, this prominent family greeted his birth with utter derision and contempt. Let me explain. Are you ready to hear? What happened? Here we go. Oh, I got a few more minutes. I'm good. I was afraid I'd run out of time. I hope I didn't go too fast, but I wanted to make sure I got all this in. Here's how the, first I give you the legitimacy of all of this story. Now I'm going to, like Paul Harvey, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Okay, it is said that Boaz had died the night after his marriage with Ruth. Ruth had conceived and subsequently gave birth to their son, Obed, who was the father of Jesse. Some rabble rousers at the time claimed that Boaz's death verified that his marriage to Ruth the Moabite had indeed been forbidden. However, later in Jesse's life, doubt gripped his heart, gnawing away at the very foundation of his existence. If Jesse's status was questionable, well, he was not permitted to remain married to his Jewish wife, he felt. And it's a vet, okay? And so uh, Jesse decided the only solution would be to separate from her by no longer having uh, marital relations. Well, Jesse's children were aware that they had decided to separate. And after a number of years had passed, Jesse longed for an offspring whose ancestry that he felt would be unquestionable. His plan was to have relations with his Canaanite maidservant. And his thought was, if my status is blemished as a Moabite, I only have the legal status of a Moabite convert being forbidden to marry an Israelite. Well, I can at least marry my maidservant and she can marry a Moabite convert. Well, the maidservant was aware of the anguish of Nitzavet. And she understood her pain in being separated from her husband for so many years. And so the empathetic maidservant secretly approached Nitzavet and informed her of Jesse's plan, suggesting a bull counter plan. Just like Leah and Rachel, she did a switcheroo. And Jesse thought he was laying with the maidservant, but it was really Nitzavet. That night, uh, uh, Nitzavet conceived, and Jesse never knew of the switch. So after three months, Nitzavet's pregnancy became obvious, and incensed her other sons wished to kill their apparently adulterous mother and the illegitimate fetus that she carried. Nitzavet, for her part, would not embarrass her husband by revealing the truth of what had actually occurred, like her ancestress Tamar, who did not want to embarrass Judah. Nitzavet chose a vow of silence. Jesse, being totally unaware of the truth behind his wife's pregnancy, but having compassion on her, ordered his sons not to touch her. Instead, the child that will be born will be treated as a lowly and despised servant, and this way, everyone will realize that his status is questionable, and as an illegitimate child, he will not marry an Israelite. So that is the story of David's youth, Growing up, and just like Messiah, he was not received by Israel. He was not received by his brothers. But I wanted you to see the depth of the pain and the suffering, how David's life paralleled Yeshua's life. Now you know the rest of the story. Let's stand. <clears throat> 